We live in a world where Islam is subject to an almighty project of reformation. In this difficult environment, the simple truths of Islam and the age-old process of arriving at such truths have been muddied by modernist constructions that at their heart hope to reconcile Islam with a dominant ideological narrative. Certainly, Islam has always had a spirit of renewal and has always accommodated change. Yet the filter to adjudicate this change has remained the tradition. This is why never in Islamic history did scholars stray too far away from usul al-fiqh as the means by which Allah's truth is revealed. In today's rather poisoned landscape, where kings and presidents endow scholarly positions through patronage and Western liberal states seek to promote a reformation from within, there is a call to modernize Islam to make it compatible with the modern liberal world. Yet what looks like a benign endeavor hides a multiplicity of falsehoods. In reality, the West looks to emasculate Islam from its vibrancy so that it fits neatly into a secular paradigm. By this, Islam no longer acts as a liberating movement that stands up to injustice, but a placid faith that can be shaped by political beliefs and reprehensible moral positions. To give this campaign a fig leaf of legitimacy, the traditional principle of Maqasid al-Sharia, loosely translated as the general goals of the Sharia, has been co-opted by liberals and secularists as a means to open up Islam to the so-called universal values of liberalism. But what is the traditional concept of al-Maqasid? When was it developed? And what are the implications and limits of this principle on Islamic thought and Sharia? Can this notion be used to legitimize usury, accept corrupt leaders or secular political parties, and can the principles of Sharia change laws when moral and political opinions change in society? To take a deeper look at this idea, Riaz Hassan and I spoke to Dr. Uthman Omerji. Dr. Omerji is a director at the Yakin Institute. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering and a Master's and PhD in Educational Psychology from the University of California, Irvine. He has studied Islam at Al-Azhar University in Cairo, Egypt, and lectures widely in Usul al-Fiqh and other Islamic and contemporary topics. It has been some weeks since we brought out a podcast. This is down to efforts to develop and structure our new team. We value your comments and want you to participate in the discussion. Please go over to our New Look website, details in the show notes, where you can comment, find transcripts, further reading material, and join our new book club. And if you want to get involved, let us know by email. Uh, Dr. Usman Omarji, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and welcome to the Thinking Muslim podcast. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair for having me. It's an honor to be here today. And uh, really, it's an honor to, to have you uh, on our show. And it's, uh, uh, it's a topic which um, I think a lot of Muslims find quite difficult to comprehend and understand. And there's a lot going on out there about a lot of discussion about maqasid. And, and of course, uh, Muslims from various persuasions use maqasid uh, as, a, as a means to, uh, uh, to, to provide fodder, I suppose, for, a, for an argument. So we want to establish what is maqasid today. And how does it impact on a Muslim and a, a Muslim's daily routine? And I suppose our way of thinking as a, as a Muslim ummah. So let's start with uh, first principles, I suppose. Um, can you explain to us and to our audience what Maqasid al-Shara is? And, um, and, and actually whether it accords with a, a, a more Christian idea of the spirit of the law uh, or, or a philosophical idea where the law has uh, an ultimate, an ultimate spirit, an ultimate end, and 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 many would suggest that maqasid uh, is similar to that type of contraption. I mean, is that how you would see it? Bismillah. So, let's start with what we mean by the word maqasid as sharia. So, this is a term that has numerous definitions from multiple scholars. But if I had to distill it into an easy, digestible definition, I would say it is a study of the higher objectives 
of the law. In other words, we're investigating its underlying causes and the secrets of the Sharia. And the purpose of this study is to realize the benefits of the Sharia in both this life and the next. And again, this definition is very, very important because it, if you notice, the definition was not the spirit of the law. It included this dimension of understanding the underlying causes and its secrets, which is part of its, uh, the spirit. But I would say that it's misleading to call maqasid the spirit of the law because maqasid itself is a subset of usul. So you cannot think about the spirit of the law without simultaneously considering the letter of the law. They work hand in hand together, right? And to think of one without the other is incredibly dangerous and actually nonsensical from an Islamic standpoint. And, and where did this concept originate? Yeah, um, I'd say without thinking about the term maqasid, but the concept of the, the of our law having objectives and causes is something which has been well established in the life of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and in the Quran. And the way you can see this is not just by looking at the ayat and the hadith that actually give us insight into this, but you see it in the companions themselves, especially someone like Umar ibn Khattab عن, who could be seen incorporating this maqasid based framework into so many of his opinions and the way he would approach topics during his khilafah. And if I give like one example from the life of the companions, I think it makes this very clear. You see that famous event that we've all probably been exposed much to in the seerah, which is when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he told the companions that do not pray Asr until you reach Bani Qureva. And of course we know that what ended up happening is that on the journey, one group of companions said, hey, we better hurry up, it's getting dark. You know, we got to pray Asr. Another group said, look, the Prophet said, don't pray until you reach Bani Qureva. So what this event establishes is that people did think about whether the law had an intent or not. And were we supposed to act upon the intent of the nas, of the legal text, of the hadith, or just act by the letter of it? And what we found in this incident was that some acted by the letter of the text and some acted by what they, they thought was the intent. And the Prophet, he accepted both. So it was something which was well established at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what this is important is that it wasn't saying that one was correct in this case. It was saying that these are two different approaches that were both validated by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, if you want to get more technical and say, when did this become more of like a scientific concept that began to be incorporated within our usul and our legal tradition? I would argue that the most explicit usage of maqasid came about with Imam al-Juwaini, Imam al-Haramain. Uh, who was the well-known teacher of, of Abu Hamd al-Ghazali in the 5th century. Uh, he actually wrote explicitly, you know, used a sentence that introduced the word maqasid. He said that uh, whoever does not acknowledge and understand the maqasid of the commands and the prohibitions, in other words, whoever does not understand and acknowledge the objectives and the causes that underlie Allah's commands and his prohibitions, then he in reality has he has no insight into the nature of the Sharia. And then from there, you saw the scientific study of Maqasid develop over the next three centuries. So one thing I want you to just try and understand from a historical context is the, because we often hear about different differences of opinion that result in fiqh and in usul to a certain extent within our deen. Um, and people are hung up on some of these um, opinions and differences. Is Maqasid a concept that is uncontested? Or is it something that is open to debate amongst the Ummah or even amongst the ulama that came previously? So that's, a, that's a phenomenal question. Um, I think everything is contested in usul. That everyone agrees upon the Qur'an as the ultimate source of our knowledge. But we differ as to how the Qur'an is pulled and utilized in our law. We all accept the sunnah as a source of law. But there's massive difference in how the sunnah is incorporated into law. That being said, I think that every jurist acknowledges, maybe with the exception of the Zahiri school, perhaps, that there, are, there is an intent to the law. How that intent is realized is the point of contention. What are the boundaries? What principles are allowed in the usul? Which ones are debated? And so I, I don't want to paint this picture that maqasid itself is debated. I don't think anyone debates that the law has objectives. What they object to or they argue is what are those objectives and what are the rules of considering it in a legal application? Okay. And in, in terms of the context or the scope uh, where Makassid applies, 
Um, would it be fair to say that it applies in all uh, aspects of the deen, that's including ibadat and ma'amulat, or is it restricted to certain things? And do, does it matter in terms of us as individuals or as a society, or is it all encompassing the application of maqasid? Okay, so I think we need to be a little bit more clear first what we mean by maqasid. So I gave a definition of it, but there are so many com- subcomponents. So at the highest level, if you just say, okay, like, do we consider the objectives of the law in ibadat and muamalat? It would say absolutely in both you consider it. And when we say consider it, you mean you think about it and you try to uncover. Now, what's the proof for this? If the core of maqasid is understanding the intent of the lawgiver and the why behind the hukum shari, right? The legal address. Why did Allah tell us this? To do or not to do or recommend or to discourage. And so when the Quran tells us, the Quran doesn't just say pray and say, I don't want you to think about why. I don't want you to think about the benefits it has, but the Quran actually tells us that salah has benefits. And it says, So we know that salah has a maqsad. And that maqsad, that objective is to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to remember and elevate the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know zakah also has a maqsad. We know that hajj and there's explicit ayat and a hadith that establish this maqsad. Now, I think your question was probably getting at, do we invoke the scientific usage of maqasid in ibadat and in mu'amalat? And I would argue from that standpoint, it is far more uh, likely to be invoked in mu'amalat than it is in ibadat. And the reason for this goes back to what uh, Al-Aiz ibn Abdul Salam, uh, Rahimullah, the great scholar, and probably one of the imams of Maqasid, he said this beautiful statement. He said, everything that Allah has legislated has benefit for us in this life or the next life or in both lives. And everything Allah has forbidden has, there was harm if we did it in either this life or the next life or in both lives, which gives us a framework that this deen and, and the Maqasid are about achieving benefit in both lives and in avoiding harm in both lives. Now, clearly we cannot determine. The human being is incapable of determining benefit and harm in the akhirah. That's outside of our domain completely. So we leave that to, the, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his revelation. But when it comes to the aspects of the dunya, there are some elements that we can think about what is the, the worldly benefit here. And that is going to be most seen in the mu'amalat, which are the, the human interactions and dealings. So I hope that clarifies the different ways of conceptualizing this. So, but then what is the difference between uh, the maqasid and the illa, the, the reason found in the text, which of course is used as a, as a means to arrive at a qiyas? Yeah, great question. Um, I would say that the illa or the scientific study of the illa is part of maqasid. And Ibn Taymiyyah actually explicitly states that. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah uh, said that uh, knowledge of correct qiyas and incorrect qiyas is predicated on understanding the maqasid of the sharia, understanding the secrets of the sharia. And he said that actually the jurist, you know, who, who the jurist only has value if he's actually mastered the maqasid to actually know what type of form of qiyas is correct and what is incorrect. To give that example, so if I'm going to make an analogy for me to figure out that what is the underlying cause of the analogy means I need to think about what is the intent of the lawgiver there. So if someone is to say, well, guess what? I think apple juice is haram. Why? Because it looks like alcohol. It has the same color. And you would say, well, that's an invalid analogy. You say, well, why is that an invalid analogy? Saying that is not what Allah intended when he forbade alcohol is forbidding drinks that look like this. And so the ability to determine the illa is intrinsically tied to your ability to decipher the intent of the lawgiver. Now, we haven't actually spoken about what are the maqasid, what are the aims of the sharia. So you said that Imam Juwaini was the first to arrive at, explicitly arrive at the idea that there is a, 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 a there are a series of objectives that are embedded within uh, the host of sharia rules. So what did Imam Juwaini come up with as, as these objectives? Yes, so Imam Juwaini, what he had done uh, was to, he did... Tam is what they call it, right? It is comprehensive scan and evaluation of the legal text. And he claimed that through his investigation of the Sharia, 
he found that it seemed like five things became most obvious to him that were the highest levels of what the Sharia was trying to establish and maintain. And the way he did this, he looked at where did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mandate worldly punishments, hudud. And he said that where he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mandating hudud is where the highest objective had to be maintained. So he said that these were five. He said there was the president, he said it was the deen, life, intellect, lineage, and wealth. And that for each of those, there is a punishment if it is violated. So if you if you kill somebody, the punishment is murder, right? Or it's, it's retaliation in that, in that case, right? The person is to be executed, right? If somebody, uh, you know, fornicates, right? There's a punishment for that. If someone steals, right? There's a corporal punishment for that, which is not the same, for instance, if somebody uh, missed a prayer, right? Or if somebody, uh, you know, did something else unethical. And so he established that these were the highest objectives of the law. Now, it's important because it doesn't mean that these were the only objectives of the law, but he considered to be the necessities of life that the Sharia was trying to uphold. Did the schools of thought, so um, the four established schools of thought that we uh, are now accustomed to, did any of the imams of the schools of thought uh, either explicitly or implicitly um, use maqasid as an idea when deriving uh, hukm shari'i? Yeah, um, khair. So just so I'm clear, we, can, we need to speak about the imams and then we speak about the madahib, right? And 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 these they're, they're tricky because they can get mixed up. So I will not speak as an expert on all four schools of law and exactly what all four imams said, but I believe that it's rather obvious that the four imams touched upon maqasid in their usul in some way, shape, or form. Uh, if I begin from the top, from my own background as being more trained in, in Maliki fiqh and usul, uh, it is seems to be well agreed upon that Imam Malik appeared to be the foremost of the four Imams in considering uh, the objectives of the law and baking them into his usul. And you can see that, for instance, with his emphasis on uh, istihsan, juristic preference, and how he developed that out. You see it in his application of saddu dhariya, blocking the, of the means, or of istislah, or what they call maslaha mursala, you know, this uh, unrestricted public benefit. So Imam Malik did a, a, a lot of work in this space, although he didn't use those terms necessarily. And then you see Imam Abu Hanifa as well in, 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 in the madhab itself, a lot of emphasis on, on istihsan as well, juris, juristic preference. Uh, I think the, the Imam who was probably the most conservative when it came to writing about maqasid or the possible application of maqasid was Imam Shafi'i. And he did this, uh, you need to understand the historical context. Uh, during Imam Shafi'i's time, there was a, a general sense of chaos in the uh, application of law as Islam began to spread throughout the regions, as foreigners embraced Islam and they were not native to the Arabic language, as different cultures embraced Islam. And so there was a lot of just confusion over how is a language interpreted. And so within Usul, right, we have a whole branch of, of semantics and linguistics, and there was just massive misapplication. So in this incident that I find to be so important to discuss that you had Abdurrahman uh, Ibn Mahdi, a great scholar and muhaddith, who literally like ran to Imam Shafi, wrote a letter to him saying, there's just chaos. People just don't know the rules of usul and they're just confused out of their mind and coming up with all kinds of strange conclusions. So please write something. So he was writing his text of Risala to really rein in the lack of a principled approach to uh, legal derivation. So this is why he heavily criticized invalid uses of istihsan. Uh, and again, his, his, his understanding of that was when folks would say things like, well, you know, a jurist just kind of, uh, he comes up with an idea in his head and he's unable to articulate it, but he thinks it's the truth. And that is going to be allowed in the law. He says, absolutely not. He goes, this type of, of nonsensical, you know, you just get less inspiration in your head and that becomes a legal evidence cannot be used. So, um, I think this kind of highlights how the evolution of the imams in, in seeing these issues, providing some boundaries, opening it up in other places. Uh, and then of course it was developed by the madahib far later on. I want to move on to an area of maqasid that's maybe misunderstood or maybe correctly understood, um, which is the area about benefit and harm. Now, benefit and harm, when we mention it just outright in those words, that comes across as being uh, almost a relative term, as subjective term rather. 
in which people can understand it in different ways and in different dimensions. So first question is, is benefit really the same thing as convenience? You know, is, is there a misunderstanding between what benefit is? Um, and the second part of that question is trying to understand what are the realms or what are the contours of benefit and harm as uh, applicable to us, both as individuals and as a society? Because earlier on, you mentioned that the role of makasids or the re rationale behind makasids is both for the dunya and for the akhirah. So do the contours of benefit and harm then also encapsulate both realms of dunya and akhirah? And then how do we kind of you know, manifest that and how do we kind of comprehend that situation? Yeah, exactly. That, that's a tough question. Um, there's a lot that could be said. Um, well, I will start with a few general statements and we'll try to unpack this. So yes, the first sentence to, to repeat and to make clear is the statement of Al-Izz ibn Abdul Salam, uh, who said that all of the Sharia is maslaha. So this, is, this was his term, right? And this is the same term Ibn Qayyim uses. And what he meant by maslaha was either achieving benefit or warding off harm. So those are two dimensions of the same coin, right? I mean, you can either gain benefit by doing something that's beneficial, or you can gain benefit by avoiding something which is harmful. So, and again, we go back to this point that everything Allah has commanded, the default of the believer needs to be that Allah knows what is of maximum benefit in this life and the next life. And Allah knows what's maximally harmful in this life and the next life, so he's forbade those things. Now here's where the tricky part comes in, is we have to decipher what, at what role does the human intellect begin to rub against uh, any possible uh, evaluation of benefit and harm from the perspective of the hukum shara'i. So if Allah says, do this, is the role of the jurist or of the Muslim to say, well, I will do this only if I determine that it is beneficial or if I determine that it is, uh, or if I determine that it's harmful, then I'll avoid it. And the answer absolutely is not. The goal of, uh, of understanding masalih is not to evaluate if there are masalih and mafasid. It is to understand what those masalih and mafasid are. And again, I want to be very clear on this. So there's a difference between me saying, Allah said, do this. And I say, I'm going to determine whether there is maslaha or harm, and then I will do it. Versus saying, there is maslaha in it. It is my job simply to, do, to try and investigate and uncover it. So I appreciate it further. And so I'll give some examples that maybe make this more clear. When the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said to the companions that had your people not been fresh out of Jahiliya, then I would have destroyed the Kaaba and rebuilt it upon the pillars of Ibrahim. What is this hadith trying to tell us? And this is where utilitarianism and kind of deontological more, um, philosophy and morality kind of, they fall apart in an Islamic framework. They're not good terms to use. Because from a deont deontological standpoint, you would say, do that which is necessitated, right? that which has been uh, obligated, and do not worry about the consequences, right? And utilitarianism says, you don't really worry about the, you know, what's being said. You look at the consequences completely. Here, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is saying, I will not do that, which is good, which is to break the Kaaba and rebuild it where, the way it should have been, because there is a greater harm that will occur. So what you can see here is that the Prophet Muhammad is acknowledging that there are pros and cons to any decision that he makes in his role as, the, as, as a prophet or even as the head of state. And the jurist has to do the exact same thing. And so there is a realm for the, the jurist to actually practice the same form of, of masalih and mafasid. You know, you can call it a cost-benefit analysis, but it can only be done with very explicit rules that have been defined by the usul. And maybe we need to unpack some of those like moving forward. So initially you, you start by saying that uh, the maslaha is defined by the sharia. The sharia is not defined by the maslaha. Right. So we, we don't say something is beneficial and so this is the sharia. We rather say that this is a sharia and, uh, and, and that is beneficial for us. So salah is beneficial for us. Fasting is beneficial for us. But then you, you, you entertain, possibly at the end of it, or maybe I've misunderstood you, but you've entertained the idea that there is a possibility that the human being can use their intellect to decide to, you call it a cost-benefit analysis of a given situation. So can you unpack that a little bit further? I mean, how does that, how do these two ideas square up with one another? Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> it's difficult, but let's take the Quranic analogy first. And we'll start with that. 
So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he actually gives us um, some training in how to think about these issues. Where he tells us about, yes, anunika al khamri wal maysir, right? They ask you about alcohol and gambling, right? And what Allah says in the ayah is that there is actually some benefit in these things, right? right? So the Allah is telling us that when the companions have asked about these objects, that can we engage in drinking alcohol in, the, in this example or engaging in alcohol, Allah said, there is, you need to acknowledge that there are some pros to things in life. And there's also some harms to these things in life. And so Allah is actually weighing it and telling us, well, but the harms outweigh its benefits. And thus he concludes that we are to abstain and to leave these type of behaviors. So you can clearly see here that Allah is performing for us the equivalent of a cost benefit analysis. So with that now, now this is important because scientific studies do come out and people say, look, Someone found that alcohol was uh, good for your heart and you drink it this way and you that way. And then another study comes out and says that, you know, regardless of all these benefits, you know, alcohol is still far worse for your health. Now, now we take something unknown, right? And, and this is why maqasid is important because it's easy to default to the hukum shari and to the nusus when they give an explicit answer about something. There's really no need to, to do this, uh, you know, this heavy cost benefit analysis when the hadith and the ayat are what we call nas, they're explicit and they can only be interpreted in one way. But when the nusus are what we'll call vanni, which is, uh, you know, there's multiple interpretations, right, that could be there, or it is mujmal, right, there's some level of ambiguity and you have to search for that, which is mubayin, a clarifier. This is actually where the jurist has to think about this, that, okay, I've got this question in front of me. Let's just take a contemporary issue. Someone wants to talk about some intricate financial transaction. Right. Uh, I guess currently, you know, everyone in the U.S. at least was talking about uh, shorting stocks because, uh, you know, there was a stock called GameStop that everyone was trying to short. And this was a big you know, catastrophe. And you take something like this and you say, OK, how do we evaluate the permissibility of these complex contemporary transactions where there may not be some explicit nos about it? Well, there's an element of now looking at all the relevant hadith and ayat. They're probably going to be ambiguous. They're probably going to give you some inclination, but nothing explicit. And thus, you have to then begin to put the cost-benefit analysis on the table as well and say, what is the intent of our economic system? What are the other principles of economics that we bring into the specific case here? And this has to be done with putting the cap on of what we think is the intent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll never fully arrive at it, but that is the job of the jurist. And to get as close as possible to the maqsad of Allah and his messenger in these rulings. So... The answer to all this is that it is extremely difficult, but that is where the jurist proves his value. I mean, anyone can say for something like, do I have to pray five times a day? Well, of course, there's a, there's a hadith that says that. But for these issues that are nawazil, contemporary issues, I, I think maqasid and cost-benefit analysis gets a whole lot more, uh, it gets more weight than, than it would in other issues. Wallahu alam. So, Dr. Usman, can I just test the uh, veracity of of the assertion of, about the example about alcohol, just a bit further. Um, so it could be argued from, from a perspective of Sharia that, you know, and because of the sequencing of the revelation of the ayahs in the Sbab al Nazul, that, you know, the, the actual hukum or, or the command is now distinct. It's now, you know, absolute. So in terms of the maqasid measuring up to as to how it was kind of revealed in, in almost in stages, if you like, um, when we look at the actual issue nowadays for, for us as Muslims living in this day in society, the issue is absolute. So I'm trying to understand how the maqasid kind of interwinds itself with hukum shari and with revelation and you know, the, the distinct and absolute revelations that we have. Um, is it a sequential thing that we look at only look at maqasid after we've kind of exhausted uh, the absolute terms of the sharia or is it almost entwined in terms of uh, how we look at different issues? There are probably multiple ways to think about this and different madhahib and mujtahids would have a different process than, than the others. So I will not say there's a uniform approach. So if you come from a madhab, like in the Maliki school, where there are a whole lot more secondary sources like Sadduthiriyah, blocking the means, like Istihsan, like juristic preference, like, you know, Maslaha Mursala. 
those will be baked a lot earlier into the process than if you come from a school of thought that actually will probably be a far more uh, using traditional usul and then invoking maqasid only as a check and a balance to see that, hmm, did this opinion seem to lead to some sort of uh, injustice, cruelty, lack of mercy? And that's kind of the Ibn Qayyim framework. He talks about that, that any law that kind of, you know, that is any aspect of sharia or aspect, any fatwa, right, that is in the end of the day is cruel or unjust is not from the sharia. So he's using this almost like a check and a balance. Um, which doesn't need to be the case if you have qawaid fiqhiyah that are baked into this process. So if, uh, uh, so give you an example of a qaida, of a principle you might use, right? There's a principle that says that there is no need to uh, consider, uh, there's no need for ijtihad in the presence of a definitive text. Right? So you would say, when I look at a definitive text, my maqasid cap doesn't get put on my head. But now in the absence of a definitive text, Maqasid again is going to be invoked further, just like I just mentioned. So I would say that the answer to your question, it depends on the method you're coming from, the usul you're coming from, and the mas'ala that is under consideration. And what is the relationship between these general evidences? So maqasid uh, is a general evidence and, um, and uh, the specific delil. So, for example, you may have... Um, you may have text on an issue. It may not be uh, it may not be qada'i text, but it, it it is still text, right? You know, it may be uh, a hadith or a uh, ahad hadith or a or or, or a uh, a Quranic verse, which is uh, which may be interpreted in in many ways. Uh, would the maqasid be utilized uh, when you have a text, or would the maqasid only be utilized in the absence of a text? on a given issue. So this is again a very debated topic within usul and I would argue that for many jurists and mujtahids maqasid will always be in their mind at some abstract level when they look at a text whether that text is uh, is qat'i or or dhanni and this is important because again we need to establish are you talking about qat'i in its dalala right or in its thubut so a text that is qat'i in its thubut uh, I mean you'd still might have to consider maqasid if it's dhanni in its dalala and the, the inverse, right? If something is dhanni in its thubut, but qat'i in zalala, you're probably not going to be using maqasid this much, right? So I'll give some examples of our, that scholars have talked about that might help with this case. One of the challenges you have when you look at hadith in particular, with the ayat, I, I think there's a slightly different approach to it, but with the hadith, is that the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, he wore multiple hats. He wore the hat of a, of a nabi and a rasul in many of his statements which need to be evaluated differently than if he was to give an opinion in his role as either just a member of a community or even as a head of state. And so for a head of state, he might have a ruling which would be considered more in the line of qada, right? In terms of, 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 uh, of, you know, of, a, of, a, of a legal opinion of a state rather than of a prophetic law that is absolute. And so you find some examples uh, as an exa in, in the hadith where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's a hadith where he said that, um, that two um, uh, young people who committed zina, you know, who are not married, then there, there's a punishment to, um, to whip them and to expel them right from the land. And so the madhahib, they discussed this quite a bit. That, okay, so do you have to expel a young girl, right, who committed zina? Because having her kicked out of her, her country for a long time, where it could be very problematic. And so there's a whole subsect, uh, uh, subsection within these usuli arguments that they call taqsis an nas bil maslaha, that can a nas, because in this statement, it's pretty straightforward. The Prophet said that if two people do this, then this is, you do A and you do B to them. But the Hanafi and the Maliki schools actually took this and said, was the Prophet Muhammad doing this in his absolute role as, as a legislator, that is, that's the law forever? Or was it a specific case that he was ruling for? And actually, you find the Malikis and, and, the Hanif, and, and, and the Hanafis actually then not necess necessitating that both A and B have to be done. And so you have cases that are like this. The same can be said in, in issues of, of irtad, of apostasy. Under what circumstances does apostasy get a certain ruling, whether it be the death penalty or expulsion from a land or possibly even just being ignored? And that, again, is going to go into how do you take the hadith in Bukhari that whoever changes his faith, right, then he is to be killed. And it, context matters a lot. And the intent of the hadith is investigated by the jurist before he applies it. So I think those are some examples of where maqasid does have a role in how you interpret anas. So, um, Dr. Rasman, in terms of um, 
the agency that's granted towards us as people of the Ummah in applying Maqasid. Uh, and the reason I ask this question is because uh, we often uh, see carte blanche application or use of this term or use of axiomatic terms uh, for Maqasid that are thrown about in day-to-day situations. So someone doesn't want to pray Jumma at work and they'll say, well, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks me to work and you know, my work, I'm taking a cost benefit analysis here and I'm working. So therefore that is not um, incumbent upon me. So it, it's very much used in different frames within society, um, again, all over the place. So how much agency do we have in terms of applying it when we wish to apply it and not applying it when we want to apply it? <laughs> yeah, um, let's be very blunt and unambiguous about this. The lay person has no business and no agency to be in the, he's not in the business of deriving law. It is akin to the agency that I would have, or you would have to perform surgery on somebody or to go and to represent somebody in the court of law. It is dangerous, unethical, and haram at every level. It is, uh, maqasid can only be used as a tool by the expert in this field who has proficiency in usul and in ifta, who knows Arabic, who understands quiet fiqhiyah, you know, who knows the Madahib's opinions and he meets all those shurut of ijtihad, that person can even enter, then begin to entertain utilizing it. Anything other than that is just pure. I mean, this, it's following hawa as what it is at the end of the day. And to be very blunt, I think this is what the modern maqasid movement has become in many ways, that it's a, it's a front for, I want to follow my desires, but I have to cloak it in some religious terminology. Uh, and I, I think that needs to be dismantled severely because the, my, my concern is that just because people have given it a bad rap doesn't mean that it is invalid, but we also need to make sure that those who have given it a bad rap, they completely get destroyed for doing this. And we don't allow this to become a way of thinking that people internalize. Actually, and, and the follow-on question from that, I mean, I, I once attended a lecture by a, a Muslim who was, uh, who was discussing Islamic governance, uh, Islam and, and politics. And um, he said that the traditional scholarly, uh, uh, understanding of governance does not accord with uh, the modern era and so there is a need to resort to maqasid now uh, in his explanation of uh, of this process he argued that maqasid stands outside of usul al-fiqh it's a separate discipline altogether and so what he was calling for was uh, he said yes we have usul al-fiqh scholars but we need to have maqasid scholars and we need to develop expertise in this area and our Islamic institutions, Al-Azhar and Medina and, and other institutions, uh, need to teach Maqasid as a separate discipline. Now is there any uh, semblance of, uh, of justification for, for such an understanding? I would argue no, but to be intellectually honest, there are some contemporary scholars who are respected who do consider Maqasid its own science. Um, but if you look in the history of Usul, you will never found any scholar writing about maqasid unless he was, not, I'm not going to just say proficient in usul, I'm going to say a master of usul. You know, like the, the lay mujtahid, and I use that term, you know, kind of, you know, pejoratively, right? Like the, the, the regular mujtahid would not t- write about maqasid. I mean, when you talk about who wrote about it and who invoked it, we're talking about al-Juwaini, right? We're talking about al-Ghazali, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim, al-Qarafi, right? You know, it, it was not done by the faqih even, right? So I believe this is being done very purposefully because what it allows us to, that person to do or that school of thought to do is to throw out any principles, any, uh, all of the considerations that have been developed over the last you know, 1,400 years of scholarship and allow them to build a new framework from scratch that in reality is just going to be, I'd say, like modern secular law in a cloaked in Islamic terminology. And, uh, and this is incredibly dangerous. It is um, never been seen before. And to be honest, it has no fruit because every single scholar who wrote about maqasid in the past said that the whole purpose of it is to understand the intent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the way you understand the intent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by using the tools of usul that tell you when there's a hukum shari, this evidence before me, what, what did Allah want? Did he mean for me to do this immediately or for me to do it later? Did he mean for it to be literal or not to be literal? Did he mean for it to be uh, you know, uh, mandatory or recommended? These are all things that Usul has done over 1400 years. For someone to say that I'm going to not study that and study maqasid by itself 
I mean, I, I can't even think of an analogy, maybe other than someone who says like, I'm going to study like, I don't know, like calculus, but like not arithmetic or algebra ever. Right? It's just impossible, right? It, it's nonsensical to even fathom that that would be an approach to, to, to law. Yeah, and, and, and you mentioned that Imam al-Jawaini had five, uh, five maqasid, life, wealth, intellect, lineage, and faith, and he derived that from the, the hudud. Uh, but but uh, you you intimated that uh, scholars that came after him uh, may have derived different maqasid and, and different rules. Can you tell us uh, something about that? I mean, um, uh, you know, what were the additional maqasid that were, uh, were uh, introduced by and, and by whom? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, yes, Joani began with the five, again, with his own human endeavor to derive what he considered the, the most fundamental objectives that were based on hudud. Then you have Qarafi who came along and said, no, no, he found a sixth. He said, there is the preservation of honor, right? And he again says this, and if you think there are ayat that tell you that if you uh, slander somebody, right, there's a punishment for their honor, you know, for taking their honor as well. He said in Surah An-Nur. So he also adds one to it, which I would argue you can subsume under lineage, but that's the, the point is Qarafi added to it. Ibn Taymiyyah comes along later on and says that, you know what, there's no need to limit the number of these. There's actually plenty of them. Uh, and he added like brotherhood, uh, then he even said things like mukhalifah, like acting differently than non-Muslims is a maqasid of the sharia. And he says, look, when the Prophet Muhammad went to Medina, you see how his law, his law changed. You see that there are things that previously we had muwafaqah with agreement. Now he's, you see, you see mukhalifah difference. He goes, this is also part of maqasid. But Ibn Taymiyyah's point was that there's no need to actually just come up with some finite number. The, the sharia has all kinds of objectives. And the jurist has to be aware of all of these rather than just thinking about those five. So did, did Ibn Taymiyyah um, uh, take out the criteria of hudud then? And, and did he develop a different criteria for how the maqasid need to be established? I would argue, yes, that Ibn Taymiyyah was no longer restricting himself to the hudud. And I don't think any scholar uh, today says that um, the hudud are the absolute criteria of maqasid, right? There was Juwaini's initial attempt at getting at the highest levels of it. But again, the key point here to me is not what are the maqasid in terms of categorizations of them being five, six, or more. The key consideration is what do you do with them? So if you say that there is five, do you only allow a deviation in a particular if it violates the five? So to give an example, right, that is, is clear that, okay, preservation of life. So if we have a rule that says pork is forbidden, and someone is dying, are they now allowed to eat pork? Well, of course, there's a nas that says you can. But again, you would argue that, look, Allah is preserving the greatest of maqasid, in this case might be the preservation of life, right? So the point here is that there is an attempt to actually act upon that or invoke that maqsad in a specific legal matter. So can we now say that we're going to override text anywhere we want to? That is the point of contention. And I don't think Ibn Taymiyyah or anybody else would say such a thing other than probably modern maqasid, uh, you know, people who want to invoke it and a few scholars that were corrected in the past for their misinterpretations. Dr. Osman, I just want to come back to the issue about um, the misapplication of maqasid, especially in today's world. Um, and the, almost the kind of retrofitting of maqasid after uh, an action or an issue has been decided almost just as a point of justification. And we, we see that in a lot of contested issues today uh, amongst the Ummah, where Islam is seen as different to the rest of society, whether it's hijab or riba or, or even voting or anything of those sorts. Now, what I wanted to try and understand uh, from a perspective is, is this a modern phenomena that we're seeing in terms of this retrofitting of maqasid uh, to these new situations? Or has this always happened throughout our history? Uh, throughout the Muslim Ummah, even when the scholars of Maqasib that you mentioned, whether it was Ghazali or Jawziya or Ibn Qayyim or Ibn Taymiyyah, when these uh, esteemed scholars were around, did this also happen? Um, I would think that, I, I would say that it did happen in their times and all times and places. This is why Imam Shafi wrote a Risala, right? He would not have wrote a book telling people, stop doing this nonsense, istihsan, if people were not doing it at that time. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim would not have written extensively on... Uh, Bab al -hiyad, legal tricks that they saw essentially num number of jurists who were following the letter of the law by creating legal loopholes to accomplish whatever it is that they wanted. 
Uh, and again, I'm not saying that the jurists had some ill intent, but they saw that, hmm, if somebody needs to accomplish this goal, we can create some legal loopholes to make it permissible. So they wrote extensively about it because they lived that experience. Um, the modern phenomena, I think, is that it is divorced from usul completely, right? In the past, it was tied to usul and it was, uh, it had to be written and proved and thus it could be refuted. In today's modern era, it is invoked without any evidence, without any uh, procedure of doing it. And then simply the, the evidence is that we've invoked maqasid. That is not evidence. And so it's very difficult in today's era to, um, to evaluate an opinion because there's often nothing behind it other than a popular figure who puts out uh, a fatwa online or on social media. And this is really not the realm of, of, of law, right, to be honest. Uh, again, coming back to the issue of benefit and harm and the evaluation of benefit and harm uh, and the subjectiveness of it, where there's it's an interpretation based upon a particular reality. So how can we determine you know, whether it is a correct application of benefit or an incorrect application of benefit. And then uh, I think related to that is the issue of prioritization of benefits because benefits can be many and harms can be many. So how do we distinguish between um, uh, the, the priority of a particular benefit over the other? And we often see this in a, in a political context, right? Where people say, well, you know, vote for one candidate is better than a vote for another candidate, even though there is some element of um, doubt or uh, bad in, in both, but we will we, we'll, we'll use the axiomatic principle of the lesser of two harms. Yeah, exactly. Um, I would say start with, let, let's take an usuli principle that is grounded in maqasid and, and build it out from there. So this is where sadr dhariya became a very popular and, and debated term. That if you take a principle like blocking the means, essentially what a scholar is determining is that here is something which is intrinsically halal. Is example, selling grapes, intrinsically halal. What is the benefit and the harm of now selling grapes in circumstances where it might be turned into alcohol? Right. So this is exactly what the jurors had to do. And they would determine, okay, is it possible that somebody who you sell grapes to goes and makes alcohol? Yeah, it's possible. Is it likely? Possibly. How likely? And they're in the business of trying to quantify this somehow. And as they get to the point of realizing that this is actually highly probable, then they might invoke now and say the ruling is now going to change. Selling grapes to someone, like to a, to a winery, for instance, is haram, according to those schools of thought that invoke this. And the same applies, for instance, selling weapons. That one will say, well, we selling weapons during times of war becomes haram because that really leads to widespread harm that goes beyond the benefit of selling weapons. So you take those as kind of a precedent to say, okay, how did a jurist think about cost-benefit analysis here? And what did they invoke things? Now we go into your opinion or your question now, of, let's say modern politics. I think the modern political spectrum of maqasid is far dicier than this, far dicier. And there are so many benefits and harms that we cannot even begin to measure. I mean, you can measure the, you know, like when it comes to, let's say, selling grapes, right? Or if it comes to, uh, you know, selling um, arms, you know, what are the harms of that? It's much easier and bounded than, for instance, what is the role of this lawmaker being in position versus that lawmaker? It has effects on the national politics. It has effects on international politics. It has effects on the identity of the person engaging in the political system. And I would almost argue that for those type of topics that go beyond probably the realm of it, no mujtahid can grasp all of these things. There needs to be a massive ijtihad by committee where, where probably experts across fields can sit in and, and have this conversation. Uh, the other thing to go back to is before we even do a cost benefit analysis for such a topic, we need to go back to the asl. So in the cases of alcohol or uh, alcohol, of selling grapes or of uh, digging a well in, or in the middle of a road, these are digging a well is permissible. Selling grapes is permissible. But when it comes to using maqasid for, let's say, voting and political actions, is the political action under uh, you know, that we're talking about permissible in the first place. And I think this is what a lot of people, they skip out when they go to Mokasit. They say they look at the benefits and the possible harms without even beginning to look at the, the asl of this issue. What would the hukum shari say about it? And if the hukum shari on it is clear, then again, we don't go into these Mokasit. If the hukum shari on it is ambiguous, then we can begin to consider those Mokasit. So this goes back to this whole point of that without usul, without having some benchmark, this is all just a game. Let, let, me, let me ask you about the, the modern 
a scholarly landscape. I mean, we, we live in somewhat anarchic. I mean, maybe, maybe you disagree with this, but it, it's somewhat anarchic now. Uh, you know, there there are scholars who uh, who give fatawa on, or, you know, two a dozen on on a number of uh, themes and and very contradictory themes. And I suppose for for ordinary Muslims, it's quite a confusing landscape. So you will have scholars who uh, permit. Uh, a lot of things which you know we find uh, we find quite problematic, and you'd have scholars who who prohibit almost everything, um, you know, and and uh, you know they they make life extremely difficult for um, for us. Now, can maqasid as an idea, because you said Imam Shafi'i developed uh, a, a, an idea, a contraption, a concept similar to maqasid to try to rein in these these stray opinions that may. Uh, may have some uh, validity in terms of their, their um, extraction, that they disagreed with the ultimate aims of the Sharia. Can Maqasid help us in, in, in the current dilemma that the Muslim Ummah finds itself in vis-a-vis -vis Islamic opinions? Uh, I think absolutely. And if we take it a step back and we ask, why are we in this Maqasid crisis to begin with? I, I believe the root is the stagnation in Usuli thought. Uh, the lack of deference and, and developments in usul, which has led to very rigid opinions being transmitted out of context, out of place, which that vacuum of saying, what well, well, these opinions just cannot work in modernity, or they make life in modernity so difficult, has led to the opposite reaction of, you know what, forget all this stuff, let's just invoke maqasid and solve all of our problems. So the solution is not to run away from maqasid, it's to properly bound maqasid and go back to what the traditional scholars had said, look at how they applied it, look at how the madahib applied it, look at how the sahaba applied it, and say, how does this now help us in the new circumstances? Because when you see Umar bin Khattab, عن, in his new circumstances, when he takes the issue, and I, and I want to be very clear on this, maqasid sometimes, uh, they don't always make life easier, right? They don't always open, you know, facilitate for people to do that which is, more enjoyable or easy in a liberal sense, they can actually restrict and make life uh, more bounded and actually tighter. And that's the thing that a lot of the Maqasid folks don't like to get into. When he looks, so we know the ruling in the Quran is that a Muslim man can marry a non-Muslim woman as long as she is Jewish or Christian, right? That's a well-established ruling. But then you see Umar Khattab as Islam is expanding and Sahaba are leaving to different lands and they start to go into lands where there's very few uh, Muslims, and they start to marry a lot of non-Muslims. And he sees the effect this is going to have, and he then writes a letter and essentially gives a fatwa that says, Muslims should not go and marry non-Muslims in those lands where they're the minorities like uh, in such cases. He's thinking about a number of different things. And you would say, well, my God, but the Quran said you can. Well, the Quran said you can, and it's a general ruling in the sense, the very particular situation that Omar, and the Quran didn't say you have to, it says you can, it's permissible. But Umar bin Khattab is saying, look, the situation is devastating for the Ummah if Muslim men marry non-Muslim women. And we are not going to permit this at this time and place. So here you see the Maqasid being used to preserve the faith of people, to preserve the well-being of the Ummah. And so that type of application, I think we need to give more weight to, is using Maqasid to restrict, you know, even things that are often considered to be permissible or to be kind of almost even not addressed in the Sharia and say, look, we need to actually close doors because the harm that is occurring through all this is just exacerbating the, the troubles that we're going through. So I think that's one of the ways that I would argue that maqasa should be employed. Uh, in addition to, of course, when there's over rigidity, but I think that many folks do that. So that's probably not where we need to spend a ton of time. We've discussed a lot about um, the misapplications of maqasa, especially in the modern world that we see around us today. Um, I, I want to kind of flip that on its head and discuss the uh, almost a well-intentioned use of maqasid, if you like. Now, uh, I've been to one of your lectures before, and, and I know you use a very uh, good quote from Akram Nadawi, uh, I believe, about well-intentioned people. So could you just give your perspective on that? And, I, and, and you know, there was, an, I think you related an incident about uh, virtual tarawih in, in, the, in the times of COVID that we have that kind of encapsulates this issue. Uh, so could you give your perspectives on that? Yeah, so uh, I think there's two sentences that I, I always like to state just to kind of give people this bird's eye view of what can maqasid do and what can, in the positive sense and the negative sense. And that is that maqasid has the ability when used by the, the jurist appropriately to illuminate the sharia 
and show its beauty and its perfection. And that's the aim that we hope that maqasid gets studied and implemented in. And the inverse of it is that the misapplication of maqasid is a torch which will burn and destroy the entire sharia. And this is where I was, again, that caution that you do not give fire to a child, right? You don't give something that is, in a, you know, like that's that dangerous to someone who doesn't know how to, what to do with it. And so maqasid is the exact same thing. In the issue of, of virtual taraweeh and some of these more contemporary issues, it goes back to this point again that who is doing this cost-benefit analysis and with what lens are they doing it? Uh, one would argue, okay, so for virtual taraweeh, it's like, okay, it, first of all, is this is this necessary for for the deen? Is it, it, and when you think about maqasid as being preserving these high-level obligations, is it one of those necessary things? It's probably not. Is it a secondary thing? Okay, most likely. And then you can go back and say, well, what is the benefit of doing it versus what is the possible harm? And it, you gain more benefit by praying at home by yourself than not. These are the types of things people have to think about. And again, I would argue that em, em, empirical work might help in some of this uh, to show that rather than people almost, imams in today's world often who give fatawa, uh, especially in Western societies, they're not just jurists who are sitting and living in the text. They're often living in communities who are being swayed by the emotions and 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 the and kind of the the pulse of what they're feeling. So I think oftentimes opinions are skewed by some of these things. So people will say, "I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to lose my faith," and that fear drives, I think, some opinions that the usul would not support. But um, there's probably a whole lot of other more relevant issues that than, than I think virtual tarawih. But uh, actually, a, a COVID-related question. Um... I came across a group of scholars uh, recently who were adamant that even that COVID is is like the flu and and um, uh, there is no cause to stop Salat al Jummah uh, at a time for of COVID and it's a bidder to to separate even if you go to uh, Salah in the mosque it's a bidder to uh, to separate uh, the uh, the musalli in the rows and. Um, and wearing the face mask is also uh, an innovation, and so uh, you know, and and a number of Muslims were swayed by this and, and were impacted and affected by it. Now, um, initially, I thought, okay, I mean, this is just an, a misunderstanding of the science, right? A misunderstanding of the reality. And of course, ishtihad or giving fatawa requires the twin side of the coin, isn't just to have a a hukum in one's mind, but it's an application of a hukum on a reality, right? Uh, but could maqasid come uh, in the Imam Shafi uh, type of, of understanding? Could maqasid be used here to nullify these uh, these fatawa? Uh, because you know, very evidently, uh, these fatwas will uh, will destroy the lives of individuals who who conduct uh, these reckless activities. Yeah, I would argue that the usul probably will do it more than maqasid. I mean, there's just there's, the, the usul itself is so well developed. And in this case, you would say, first, these are oham, right? I mean, first of all, like, you know, people, this is not based on any, like, certainty. This is all, you know, just, it's it's hearsay. Um, and when you start to say things like people said a face mask is bid'ah and stuff, I mean, that's the equivalent of saying that, like, microphones and, like, internet is, like, bid'ah, like, all these type of things, right? So I don't even need to um, entertain that as kind of a legal thought. Now, if someone was to say something like separating in the lines is something which is forbidden, right? Those are the things where the usul needs to now go into it and say, okay, what are the exceptional circumstances by which the haikal of the salah, right, the form of the salah can change, right? And, and there's a lot that's been written about this in, 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 in classical usul and fiqh. So, for instance, like, we have two-story buildings, right? And there's a lot that was written on, like, what's, what if the imam is on the bottom floor? Can you pray on the top floor? What if the imam is on the top? So there's enough in the usul to give us insights that show the permissibility of a lot of these things. And it's the, the, the burden is on the person who brings it to bring evidence. You can't say that this is a bid'ah and leave it. You'd say, if you say something is forbidden or against the usul, evidence has to be stated. And I'm assuming from what you're saying, these are usually just like lay people who are saying these things. If it's a scholar who's saying it and he brings no evidence, his word is worth the word of a lay person. And the usul will allow us to decipher, again, what Ibn, Qayyim, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah said, the right qiyas versus the wrong qiyas. And if you don't understand the murad of Allah, the intent of Allah, you will not be able to engage in this endeavor at all. Uh, and one final question, uh, Dr. Osman. I mean, it, it, this has been um, really fascinating, actually. And we've, um, I mean, I've, I've learned a lot from uh, today's session. Um, maybe a more general question. I mean, many young Muslims are um, 
uh, are coming to Islam or at least entertaining uh, the thoughts of Islam in a, in a wider context uh, than ever before. And, and um, uh, I suppose social media helps in, in uh, engendering this sense of uh, reawakening uh, of, uh, of the young Muslim community. But at the same time, there are, of course, dangers uh, with uh, enthusiastic people, whether it's old or young, who, uh, who, who may not have the relevant study before uh, they come to some conclusions. What advice could you give to a, a young Muslim who, who is starting out, who wants to, who wants to do uh, good for Islam and who wants to live by Islam and he wants to uh, enjoy al-ma'ruf and forbid munkar and he wants to you know, carry Islamic da'wah and he, he's got... He's got an impatience, and and quite rightly sometimes, you know, when he when he sees the uh, the dire state of, of this ummah, how does a, a Muslim ground themselves in in the study of Islam, and and what course what course of action should that Muslim take uh, in order to in order to come to a a, a more uh, a stronger uh, a, a stronger grounding, I suppose, in in the Islamic faith. Exactly. That is a that is the million dollar question, right? We'd all like to have the answer for. Um, maybe some heuristics uh, will be better than giving a, a full answer. I think the very first you nailed it is social media right now is an absolute. Uh, it is like the fire I mentioned, uh, you know, with people playing with maqasid or anything else. It is not a place to take your deen from if you're not grounded in anything. So those who uh, flock to popular personalities by the number of uh, followers they have. Uh, this is likely to lead to all kinds of problems. So my suggestion and my advice always is you have, this deen has been transmitted to us through inter interpersonal relationships with people that you know and you're next to regularly. The first step is finding someone locally that you trust their deen and their knowledge and learning from them. This will safeguard you from all the clutter that's happening around the world. Uh, and that's on social media and on the internet, because these are not the places that you go into. It's the arena you go into after you have some some skills. Uh, so first is I think find someone of knowledge. And when I say someone of knowledge, someone who's been trained somewhat classically or has been trained by someone who's been trained classically. So in uh, traditional Sunni thought, right? In uh, traditional usul, in traditional, traditional aqidah, these type of things would be the starting point. Beyond that, I think reading of of books, again, by scholars who are agreed upon by this ummah, you know, 1400 years of our legacy where people have been stamped as being authentic sources of knowledge um, would also be a great place. And likely you'll get those recommendations from the scholars that you've learned by, right? So when someone tells me that, hey, I'm studying usul and I'm reading this 21st century scholar and he's my go-to, I'd say, well, you know, you probably want to read first what has been written more classically because that's what's been accepted. This is this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, you know, tamhis of, of, of people and of ideas, right? Those that were... Those are ideas that have been allowed to stay with us are those that have been filtered by our ulama for, for many, many generations. So I think that's so finding a local scholar, studying the books of those who are well-trusted and established. Uh, and then beyond that, at that point, once you have some level of, of, uh, of competency, I still don't think you should engage in the social media type of a world and argumentation, these type of things. There's, I do a cost-benefit analysis personally, and I say... Well, personally, I, I find like you will not find uh, the best of students and the best of scholars uh, spending most of their life in these arenas. Uh, they will find them benefiting their communities, benefiting their students and building something substantial. SubhanAllah, you see this especially today. You see scholars who pass away who are unknown. Right? There's people who, Allah's soldiers that are out there, they're not always on social media. They're not always in these popular spaces. They have 10 students, 15 students, 20 students. Finding one of those teachers is better than finding every popular figure in the world. And, and that is really, if I can give one piece of advice, find that person who will invest in you as a person rather than somebody who's popular who will never know your name. Wallahu alam. Dr. Uthman Omarji, Jazakallah khair for your time today. It's my absolute pleasure to be here. I, I really enjoyed your questions and, uh, and and I look forward to more conversations. This is a study that a subject that I think we're just beginning to scratch the tip of the iceberg on. So, you know, may Allah guide us to illuminating the Sharia through the study of Muqasid and preventing folks from burning it down by its misapplication. <laughs>